in this bottle and return it on Father's Day, and that money is used to help educate people about the alternatives to abortion. We'd like to also invite you to help with Vacation Bible School, which will be July 21st to the 25th, and that's a date change. We invite you to sign up and help where you're comfortable. If you have any questions, please contact Lorraine Murphy, Chris Brinkman, or Terry Sager. There'll be a sign-up sheet outside the office. Finally, we do recognize the special days of members of our congregation, including the birthdays this week of Jake Cutshaw, Carolyn Dodds, and Ella Gillard, and the anniversary of Jake and Jamie Oppenheimer. God bless you all. Welcome again, and now we invite you to join us for our call to worship. Will you stand as we sing, Come Just As You Are, hymn number 481.
to worship you in spirit and in truth. And we humble ourselves before you, Lord. We thank you for each one that is here. We thank you for the opportunity that you give us to assemble as brothers and sisters in Christ. We ask, Lord, that you would be with us as we come before you, as we come to see you working, as we come to receive from you that which you desire to give us, Lord. We give you thanks and praise. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. You may be seated as we welcome our worship leader, Tim Mayo. Good morning, everyone. It's a beautiful day out. It's nice to see the sun shining again. I'd like to welcome you all to the church, First Baptist Church. It's God's church. It's our church. It's His church. And uh, if you're a visitor here today, we ask that you uh, sign in the little red books, first of all. Also, in the bulletin, there's a place to uh, list any prayer concerns in that. A little tear-off sheet you can fill those out and drop them in. Uh, we'll definitely be praying with you. Uh, Pastor did some of the announcements in the video, and that uh, the only other one that I want to draw attention to is men's breakfast is this Saturday. If you're planning on attending, please sign up in the red book so we have some idea on the number there. Um, if there's any other announcements, we're going to do that at the end of the service. But I, I wanted to share something that happened to me this week. And it, it really struck home. Thursday night, I uh, developed ill intent. The wife was late coming home from work, and so I, I asked her when she did get home if we could go eat Chinese. Well, my intent when I go eat Chinese is to close the place down. I'm going to eat everything. And after spending a half hour in there, I was miserable. And I realized I wasn't going to get it done. And so my next goal was to get out the front door before the, the wife had me pay for it. And so I started waddling toward the front door, and as I hit the door, I hear this voice that I've known for over 40 years. She goes, Tim, and I go, yeah. And I'm thinking she wants me to pay for it, and she goes, no, do you want your fortune cookie? Okay. I. You know, I don't pay attention to the words that they give you, the little Chinese words. I can't pronounce them. But I do read the fortune. And the fortune that day was believe in miracles. Okay. Not being the firstborn, that starts raising questions in my mind. The first one that popped in my mind is, can God use a little Chinese lady to speak to me? Danny's been beating us up in Sunday school on the attributes of God. You know that he, he's all-knowing, he's, he's unchanging, he's all-powerful in that. And there's one thing I've learned in life is you don't question authority or tell somebody in authority what they can do. I did that once when, when my dad walked up to me and apologized for spanking me unjustly and asked me to forgive him. And I said, sure, I'll forgive you but I think I ought to get a thank you. And I paid what they call the consequences. So I wasn't going to do that with God. I'm going to give him the fact that he could use a little Chinese lady in Clay Center, Kansas with a fortune cookie, a Chinese fortune cookie that probably wasn't made in China, probably made in the U.S., to deliver a message. The next question I have had was, do I believe in miracles? You know, I stand before you, a guy that doctor said wouldn't walk after being burnt. I stand before you as a guy with somebody else's kidney inside of me when I told the doctors I didn't have time for them. I stand alive today after being married to the same woman for 40 years. And so I believe, you know, I believe in miracles, you know. The only reason, well, I hate going to the hospital because they always have you fill out this information with surgery. And, and we started counting one day, and I'm up to 14 right now. I don't know why. And the only picture I can come up with is God and Satan have sat there, and they were trying to decide what to do with me one day. And Satan says, you know, God, 
in your Bible, you wrote, in the beginning there was nothing, and you created all things. And to me, that means he's your problem. And God says, yeah, but you know, I sent my son, and he died for all the sins. And when he was on the cross, he said, it's finished. And what that meant was, the bill was presented, God laid down his credit card, he paid for it, and that means he's done. Everything's paid for. And so what Satan does with me after that, that's on Satan. Well, they didn't know what to do with me, so they threw me on Pastor Matthew's doorstep and said, let him earn his angel wings off of that. So that's where I ended up Thursday night. Friday night, I hear a knock. I'm watching TV with my eyes closed. And I hear a knock on the door, so I get up, go to the door, I look outside. There's, there's, I didn't see anybody. I open up the door, and there's this little gal standing at the door. And uh, she said that uh, she was here to borrow some decorations for a wedding. And so I wake him up, and I help him load the decorations. And as they're sitting there talking, and I'm standing right beside him, she says, did you talk to your hubby about tomorrow? Well, I'm standing there, so I don't have a hubby, so I'm assuming she's not talking to me. And what I'm really starting to hear is something's been decided that I'm going to pay the consequences on. And I later learned that what they're needing, they've got a wedding the next day, a couple getting married, a couple with no money, no photographer, and they're needing somebody to take pictures. So I, I find that out later, and, and I said, you know, that's fine. That just means I can't do anything Saturday, because I'm going to get dressed for that's right. That means when I get up Saturday morning, I'm going to put on my wedding clothes, and that's it. So I go to the wedding on Saturday, and the bride's, groom, uh, bride's father walks up to me. You know, I mentioned that they didn't have any money for a photographer, right? But I wasn't going to get paid. But he walked up to me and he said, you know what? Do you know, do you know about the garden? And I go, what, what about the garden? He, he says, you know the garden where, where Christ was. And I go, yeah, maybe. And he says, you know, in Gethsemane. And I said, oh yeah, I heard about that. And he goes, you know what? Christ, do you know how many people were there when they came to the garden? Well, it wasn't, it wasn't a Baptist occasion. It wasn't, the ushers weren't there to take count. So I had no idea on the number. And he says there was over 700 people there. And I said, well, I knew there was quite a few. And he said, you know what? And I go, now what? And he says, he knocked them all over. And I go, huh? You know, he's got my attention. Because this sounds like something a middle child could, could really relate to. If I could walk into a building and knock everybody over, I could handle that. That would get your attention. That would draw attention to me. And I really thought, you know, i got to check that out. And, and, of course, I'm not going to believe him right off. But he said, turn to John. John 18, he said. And so I went home that night and I opened it up. And it says, Jesus, therefore, knowing all things that would come upon him, went forward and said to them, Whom are you seeking? They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said to them, I am he. And Jesus, who betrayed him, also stood with him. Now when he said to them, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. Now that had my attention. Three words knocked them all, 700 people down. And I thought, well, you know, he's got them on the ground. He's surely got to do something else to them, give them a wedge or something. So I went on and I, and I was reading, and it says, uh, Jesus answered, I have told you that I am he. Therefore, if you seek me, let me go their way. 
that the sayings might be fulfilled which like, like he spoke of. Those whom you gave me, I have lost none. And then it gets into Simon Peter. Now, I don't know if it thought about Simon Peter. I heard about Peter in uh, business school. It was called the Peter Principle. And what that is, is a guy tends to get into a job and he tends to excel until he reaches his limitations. And then he sort of stalemates out. You know, he still has high hopes in life. He still hopes to make millions and be the, the number one guy. But it ain't going to happen. He's reached the end of the road. And I thought, you know, that's a lot like life is today. We all reach that, that plateau. We all reach that limit. And we lose hope. But it goes on and it says, Then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew out and struck the high priest's servant and cut off its right ear. Now this is what I call the, the Peter syndrome. Where a guy thinks he can do more. Here he just witnessed Christ with three words knock down 700 people. And in his response, he pulls out a sword and he locks off an ear. And we get in that same syndrome. I have that same syndrome. God gives me an instance and I, I think I've got it under control. I'm going to pull out and do whatever I needed to do to take care of it. But I'm reminded that's not what it's all about. Because the next verse says, So Jesus said to Peter, Put your sword unto the sheath. Shall I not drink the cup whom my brother, or whom my father has given me? And it reminded me. You know, in Sunday school today, Danny, Danny reminded us that this was the deepest and darkest time. They took a teacher, an all-knowing teacher. They took a healer, and they took the greatest chef around that could feed 5,000 people with just a few loaves of bread and a couple of fish and still have leftovers. And, you know, Clay Center, we've sort of been struggling with a time where, where we've had a couple young men maybe decide that life had no hope. There wasn't anything more to look forward to. You know, we can look at the people in Nebraska that have suffered the flooding. And then, you know, we talk about maybe not getting into the fields because it's real wet. But they're talking years before they can get back in the field and plant something. They've lost their home, they've lost their job, and they've lost their future in their future. And yet, God can take those darkest times. And all He wants you to do is put your sword down, sit beside it, and just turn it over to Him. And you know, that's why we're here today. is because God is here, right in this, this sanctuary with us, sitting right beside us. And He, he, he knows our problems. He knows our the things we're struggling with. And he's saying, just turn it over to me. You know, don't, don't take the cup from me. Allow me to participate. Allow me to share this omnipotent God, this all-knowing God, the immutable God, the one that never changes, is here sitting beside you right now wanting to share. And that's the miracle in life, you know, when we reach these times where we're struggling with something. It's not the instant cure that we need to rejoice in. It's the fact that this God wants to sit with us and share our lives. And that's what's important. Um, that's my thought for today. That's, that's what I hope you find in the worship service today. Um, we're not doing right hand of fellowship. There was a movie. I've got already done. Oh, already done. So we'll ask the ushers to come forward. And we'll go to God.
Dear Heavenly Father, we just come before you today to know, knowing that you are the sovereign God, the, the one that has everything under control. You know the future, you know the past, you know the things to come. And we just ask that you help us to release those things to you. Help us to put our shields, our swords away. And help us to lean on the comfort that you offer. The safety that you provide, knowing that you are the one true God. We just thank you for the hope and the promise that you provide each and every one of us. The fact that you can take these trials that we, we encounter each and every day, and we can turn those over to you, and, and you'll see us through it. And we just praise you that uh, you are that one true God, the one of mercy and the one of love. And we just offer these small tokens to you. We pray that you use them for your glory and your desires. In thy name we pray. Amen. as we sing our hymn of praise, Take My Life and Let It Be Consecrated. We'll sing verses 1, 2, and 6 of the following along in the hymn.
if you will pray with me. Uh, Father God, we do thank you so very much for the opportunity to unite together this morning. We thank you for each one that is here. Uh, we thank you that you're in control. We thank you that you work mightily. And Lord, that's our desire to allow you to work in our lives. Father, we lift to you and continue to pray for Heidi and Jesse, we're in their family, Lord, that you minister peace and comfort to them as they mourn the loss of Jesse's father. We uh, pray also with Greg and Kathy White and their family as they mourn the loss of Emery, Lord. Uh, we lift them to you, and we know that there are others in our community that have lost loved ones recently as well, and we lift them to you and pray that you bring peace and comfort to them. We lift to you our friend Leroy as he's preparing shortly for surgery on his back. We, Lord, ask that you would work on that, that everything would go well, that there'd be no problems or complications in that situation. We lift to you our friend Donovan as well and pray that as uh, he faces his situation, Lord, that you would work in that, Lord. That we lift him to you and pray that you would uh, work mightily, that your will would be done and the truth would be made known. Father, we lift to you these requests that have been shared. Uh, we pray um, for a positive solution for a situation involving uh, Joe May, Lord. We lift him to you in the health issue that he's facing, Lord. We pray also for uh, safe travel and a good visit to for our visitors to Clay Center, Lord. Uh, we thank you that they're here and pray that you would bless and encourage them. Uh, we do pray also for a safe and harmonious trip with other couples that this uh, these visitors are expecting, Lord. We just thank you and praise you for the way that you work and Lord, we are mindful of the many graduates that, and graduations that are occurring over the next couple of weeks. Lord, we pray that you would guide and direct those that are graduating uh, either high school or college, that if they t as they take the next step in their life, Lord, we ask that you would direct them according to your will. Again, Lord, we give you thanks and praise for you are worthy of it. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. And you may be seated now as the choir sings, Soli Deo Gloria. <laughs>
As the choir comes down to join you, the children may be dismissed for Children's Church. And as they are being dismissed, uh, I invite you to open your Bibles, if you will. We will be reading from uh, the prophet Jeremiah in the Old Testament. And uh, I would invite you to stand as you are able as we read. I'll be reading from the New King James Version. And if you have a different version in front of you, um, it may say a, a few different words here and there. <coughs> I'm going to start at verse 4, that is verse 6, so we'll catch up in just a minute. Uh, it's moreover, you shall say to them, thus says the Lord, why will they fall and not rise? Will, no one, or will one turn away and not return? Why has this people slidden back Jerusalem in perpetual backsliding? They hold fast to deceit, they refuse to return. Verse 6, I listened and heard, but they did not speak aright. No man repented of his wickedness, saying, What have I done? Everyone turned to his own course as the horse rushes into the battle. Let's pray. Lord, again, we thank you for your word. We thank you for its power, that it is truth. We pray, Lord, that you would speak to our hearts this morning as we consider your word. We thank you for what you've accomplished already. Uh, this morning in the worship service, and we look forward to our time of communion uh, to follow shortly, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. This morning we begin a new sermon series. It's the beginning of a new month, and that is often the case. Uh, the purpose of this sermon series is to really challenge us to evaluate our attitudes. The basis of our message is found in the uh, God's message uh, from the prophecy of Jeremiah. Jeremiah is an interesting book. Uh, God inspired Jeremiah the prophet uh, to write to the people of Judah, uh, God's chosen people. And in it we see uh, really a lot of emotion. You know, if you like emotion, there's an awful lot of emotion in the book of Jeremiah the prophet. Uh, Jeremiah. We see emotional exchanges that promote compassion and protection for the people of God. But it also asks for judgment. Judgment for those who do evil. And this judgment, Jeremiah reminds us, may be applied to the people of Judah themselves. You know, we like that. We are like that. We do that all the time. We look around the world and we see all that is wrong with the world and we say, God, why don't you take care of those people? I shouldn't point over here like I'm talking to people in the overflow. You know? You know, but we do that. We point and we say, God, look at, look at them. Look at them. Look at them. But really, we ought to be looking at our Selves. And that's what Jeremiah was talking because they had been, the people of God had been disobedient and they had not believed God. Jeremiah 8 is where we're at. In this chapter, in it, we are looking at um, some very, uh, it begins, we didn't read it, but in chapter or verse 1, it begins with some very um, uncomfortable imagery. Disturbing imagery. We don't like to. We don't live in a world where anything is just uncomfortable anymore. We have safe places here, and we have every, everybody has to be politically correct. But Jeremiah chapter eight, you know, later on when you go home at lunchtime, take it out and look at it. But verse one, um, at that time it says, says the Lord, verse one of, of chapter eight. At that time says the Lord, they shall bring out the bones of the kings of Judah and the bones of its princes and the bones of the priests and the bones of the prophets and the bones of the inhabitants of Jerusalem out of their graves. So that's the beginning of chapter eight. Not really a happy, feel good kind of a message. But you know what? We can't always have happy, feel good kind of messages. All right. Now, what does that tell us? Well, the reason he talks about that is the custom of doing that, the custom of raising somebody's bodies and scattering their bones, 
There was a significance in that. And it was the highest expression of hatred and contempt. Hey, there you go. You go at lunch and say, well, Pastor Matthew told us what the highest expression of that was. And I share that with you to give you the idea of the seriousness with which Jeremiah was addressing these people, his people. It is with that understanding that the words that were written and spoken to the people of Judah, that these were people that should know better. These were people uh, that were among the chosen people of God. It shows that there was an issue here, and it was an issue of the heart. Our series is called Give Me a Break, you know, and we're going to speak to our hearts this month. And when we hear those words, give me a break, we're tempted very often to think of a couple things. We're thinking, we, we're tempted of thinking, man, it's been a long couple of weeks. Man, we've, we've worked really hard. We're really tired. Oh, let me just sit down and rest for a little bit. That's not what we're going to talk about. We're also tempted uh, to think about the times when we say, give me a break, when we're a little bit disappointed, you know, when somebody says something and we go, seriously? Really? We, we do a lot of that when people that reside in Washington, D.C. speak, whether they're Republicans or Democrats, independents or socialists, whatever. Doesn't matter. When they say something, we go, give me a break. It's like they don't have a connection with the real world. Or if you're like me and you hear the expression, give me a break, you think about Kit Kats. You know, give me a break, give me a break, right? And I tell you now, if you behave yourself, just like in Sunday school or children's church, I have a bag of Kit Kats. And at the end of the service, if you greet me this way, you can get a Kit Kat this morning. But as you eat it, it may remind you of something you don't want to be reminded of by the time this message is over. All right. Today, though, as we begin our series, Give Me a Break, we're asking God to break our hearts so that we can respond appropriately to His leading. Unfortunately, we live in a world where people's hearts are hardened, and we as believers in Jesus Christ, it's not hard for us. It's not difficult for us to slip into that as well. We begin this morning by looking at the refusing heart. And to do this, we are going to explore that passage that we read, Jeremiah 8, verses 4 to 6. And I just want to caution you right now. I may say Isaiah throughout this service. Um, if I ever say Isaiah, I don't mean to. I mean to say Jeremiah. But even when I, I search for Jeremiah, I'll look up and type in Isaiah. I do it all the time. So if I say Isaiah, what do I mean? Jeremiah. Jeremiah. And I'm sorry that you have a pastor that just, you know, but just so you know. So if you're looking up a scripture and you go, that is not what Isaiah 8 says. I mean Jeremiah. All right. So we see people that first in verse 4, people that refuse to rise. Verse 5 asks what would normally be a rhetorical question. Will they fall and not rise, he says? And now you, all of us have experienced missteps. Have you ever done that? You know, a couple weeks ago I had a, a little bout with vertigo and it wasn't very pleasant and I'm not real happy about it and I hope it never happens again. But after that, anytime Danielle and I would go for a walk, you know, we like to go on date walks, but anytime we go for a walk, if I stumble or if I step into a hole that I didn't see or something, she's, oh, are you okay? I feel like I'm a man that's 137 years old. At least she cares about me. But the other day we were walking down the road, and you know how they've been working, the wonderful street people? Not street people, but the street, what do we, what do we call them? Street commission? Right, road commission. Street people, road commission, you know. Anyways, you know, they had been doing some work, and I wasn't paying attention, and the one side of one step was a little higher, so I, you know. And I had a little misstep. And, of course, when you do that, you always play it off like you meant to do that, you know. Oh, oh, oh. You know, you stretch and go, yeah, I'm getting ready to jog, right? You know? We've all had missteps. Physically, we do that. Verbally, you know, one of the things, you know, we misspeak sometimes. And one of the things we as a family, we love to do, when somebody says something wrong, we always point it out. You know? There's no grace or compassion in the Coleman household. 
You know, and the only one to blame for it is me, because I'm the one that started it. And you know, Danielle would say something wrong and I would point it out. And I never realized that I say things wrong far more often than she does. And she doesn't even point it out anymore. She just arches her eyebrow ever so slightly. She doesn't have to say anything. And I just go, I know, I know, you know. That's what keeps the spice in our marriage. That's what keeps it so exciting after all these years. But we've all done things like that, where we maybe we've misstepped physically, or we've misstepped in what we say, you know. We've all done that. Now, Jeremiah is not speaking about tripping while walking or, or making a mistake in what he says. He's speaking about ethical things. He's speaking about spiritual matters. He's speaking about oh, sin. He's speaking about sin. When we fall, when we fail in sin, how should we respond? Well, the answer is stated in the question, will they fall and not rise? The idea is that when we fall, when we fail, and we will, the proper response is to get back up. But the people of Judah apparently had gone away from this attitude, and it's kind of sad. Well, no kind about it. It's sad. They seem to be, they seem to be in a place where when they fall in sin, they stay there. Now, that doesn't sound like 2019, does it? But this is just the beginning of the criticism that Jeremiah has for these people. These people of God. First, they fail to rise when they sin. Second, we see people that refuse to return. And we see that in verses 4 and 5. Will one turn away and not return? Why has this person slidden back, Jerusalem, in a perpetual backsliding? They hold fast to deceit. They refuse to return. Again, Jeremiah's question is one of disbelief. The people are acting in a way that is contrary to the normal expectation. You know, we don't like expectations. We don't like when people have expectations for us. We want to just do our own thing. But these people, they have fallen, fallen, they have fallen, they have failed. Yeah, Danielle just raised her eyebrow because I said failing. <laughs> Can I say? Anyways. They refuse to rise. They refuse to get up. They decide to wallow in the mud like a pig. They decide to stay in sin. And now he further reprimands them. The first concern that he raises is bad. They've fallen, but the second concern here in their refusal to return is that they've made, they've been made aware, it's the idea that they've been made aware of their error. They've been shown their mistake. They understand that what they've done is wrong. They know that it's a sin. And they still decide to stay in it. For example, a silly example, if I decide that this afternoon I'm going to go to Manhattan and I get in my car and I pull out on 6th Street and I head north and at Crawford or 24 I decide I'm going to go west. And Vicki Wynn's sitting in the car with me and she goes, hold on a second, Pastor Matthew, if we go this way, it's going to take an awful long time to get to Manhattan. And I say, oh, okay. So we go back home. Pull out of the driveway. Get on 6th Street and I head north. And I get to the intersection of 15 and Crawford. And I go west. And Vicki goes, all right, buddy. What did you understand? And I said, oh, okay, well, let's try this again. And I get in my car. You see the picture? And I head north on 6th Street. And I want to go to Manhattan. And I head west. And she's going to start going, all right, stupid. <laughs> now, she wouldn't do that because she loves me, right? But sooner or later, it starts scratching your Oh, like Heidi was scratching her head just at the right time. Sooner or later, you start scratching your head saying, what doesn't this guy get? Manhattan is to the east. And he keeps going west. And that's the idea here, that these people of Judah, they were headed in the wrong direction. They were headed in opposition to God. They were headed in dis to disobedience in God. They were in defiance to God, and they knew it. And they kept going in 
that direction. They were warned that they were headed in the wrong direction. How did they respond? They kept doing it. The idea of refusing to rise in these refusing hearts is to make a mistake and you're happy to stay there. The idea of refusing to return is that you make a mistake and you're instructed about it and yet you still continue to make the mistake. Now, if you thought that the people of Judah were foolish, you are not alone. In fact, there was a Methodist minister who lived in the 1700s and 18, early 1800s named Joseph Benson, and he agrees with you. He said that the people of Judah were represented in this passage as the most stupid and senseless people in the world. Now, there is a statement. And if I were to ask you, would you like to be counted among the most stupid and senseless people in the world? We would naturally say what? No. Absolutely not. No. We're conservative Kansans. No. We're the salt of the earth. But sadly, there are people that make the same mistake. There's an interesting word that is in this passage of Scripture and an interesting phrase in, in verse 5. You know, sometimes we just read right through it. And I know that that language from um, Mr. Benson there is a little bit harsh. But as we think about it, uh, there's an expression in here that we just kind of go by real fast. And it's this expression, perpetually backsliding. And what we see in that expression, it's both interesting and both and very, very sad. Especially as we remember that who is he talking to? He's talking to supposedly people of God. But for the word backsliding, that's another interesting word. It's used 12 times in the Old Testament, this particular version of it. Uh, 12 times in the Hebrew in the Old Testament. Nine of those times, just to give you a sense, nine of those times occur in the prophecy of Jeremiah. So again, to get the flavor of Jeremiah, if he's talking about backsliding nine of the twelve times that it's used, his message is again not not a really encourage. It's not an encouragement to continue in the direction you're going. He uses it to describe a condition of faithlessness that results in apostasy or waywardness. All right, and waywardness is a turning away from the truth. And when we think about it, yes, that is bad. But what makes it even more worse is this adjective that Jeremiah, that Jeremiah Pale pairs with it. You know, He says they're turning away from the truth. That's bad, right? But he says they're doing it perpetually. Perpetually. And now this word is a very, very strong word. And it's often used in reference to God and his character like Tim talked about earlier. The character of God. But it implies an enduring quality. And what is very, very interesting is that there is an idea of victory associated with the word. And so as we think about the idea of being perpetual and perpetually backsliding, we can see it as the idea of a victorious waywardness, which means the waywardness is winning. The turning from the truth is winning in that person or those people's lives. A faithlessness has taken hold by choice. And there is perhaps no sadder statement that could be made about believers in that they, except that they here, are choosing to live a life without faith, even though they know better. But that is the character of these people. These people refused to rise, they didn't get up when they fell. They refused to return when they would, were corrected themselves. Um, they didn't correct themselves when sin was identified. And this is because of our last criticism that the people of Judah face this morning. We last see that these people are a people that refuse to repent in verse 6. Verse 6 says, I listened and heard, but they did not speak aright. No man repented of his, own, of his wickedness, saying, What have I done? 
everyone turned to his own course as the horse rushes into the battle. Now this passage, like many in the Bible, is one that we often read very, very quickly. We go right through it and we move on. But within it are some of the most striking words that we read concerning the hearts of man. But we must remember again who is speaking these words, because again, it is God. Jeremiah wrote, Thus says the Lord. Now, the Bible is the word of God. God inspired it. He chose the word. So yes, even before that, it's the word of God. But here, God specifically says, Write this down that I'm saying this. So we are reminded that this is not the opinion of Jeremiah. This is not the opinion of Pastor Matthew. This is the opinion of God, the creator of the universe. And he says, I listened and heard, but they didn't speak aright. But he goes on to say these words, No man repented of his wickedness. In those words, we have some of the saddest statements in the Bible. It's ranked right up there with Genesis 6, 5, where it says, Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart were only evil continually. How we can read that and not shiver and not challenge ourselves. Or Judges 21, 25, in those days there were no kings in Israel. There, were no, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. Again, we see that echoed in what Jeremiah is writing. What is spoken in Jeremiah 8.6 is truly the root of the issue concerning the heart of these people. Yes, they refused to rise. Yes, they refused to return. But that was because they refused to repent. Now, repent is the opposite of the choice that they made to perpetually backslide. Backsliding is turning away from God. Repenting is turning toward God. But there's another level in this Hebrew word for repent. And there always is, isn't there? And we see the emotion that we often associate with repentance. The New Testament repentance, uh, word for repentance, is, doesn't have quite as much emotion attached to it, but the Old Testament has an awful lot attached to it emotion-wise. It's connected with pity. It's connected with consolation. It's connected with mourning and sorrow and regret. And the idea is that we have pity on ourselves because we have evaluated we have looked at our lives and we have seen we have come up short we have missed the mark we have failed we have fallen we have sinned to look at ourselves to look at our lives to look at our hearts and really grieve over who we are and what we have done that's the idea we think oh yeah well I have emotion I have pity boy Look at Dick Reeves over there. Man, what a guy. Oof. His life is a mess. Poor guy. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about getting a mirror, looking in that mirror and going, Matthew? Oof. And that's what he's saying they did not do. They did not have pity upon their own Wickedness. They didn't have an understanding of the true nature, their true sin nature. They didn't repent. And as we consider these people, the people of Judah, we see a people that had a heart, a refusing heart. First, they failed to rise when they had fallen. They were happy to sit in sin. Second, they refused to return. When they went adrift, they'd been corrected, but they didn't make a change in the course. And finally, we see that it is rooted in the reality that they refuse to repent. To understand and see themselves or their sin or what they are and it is. So what's the point? Why does Pastor Matthew bring this up? Do I think you're all horrible, horrible people? No. The point is, though, that this attitude, this challenge, isn't just reserved to a group of people that Jeremiah sent a message to all those years ago in the Old Testament. Because like I said, there is a danger for us sitting in our pews in 2019, living our comfortable lives in Kansas in the United States, looking at other people, judging them, 
We think, wow, I'm not doing so bad. I'm in church on a Sunday morning. There's a lot of people that aren't. I don't do anything as bad as that person over there does. But with each comment like that, we take a step away from remembering who we are, who God is, and what He has done for us, and why He had to do it. So this month, I say to God, give me a break. Break my heart again to the truth of sin, to the consequence of sin, my sin. Break my heart to the truth that every time I fail, it has an impact. Not on my eternal destination. If I'm saved, and I am, Jesus Christ is my Savior. My salvation has been established. That is set. It cannot, it will not be taken away from me. But when I sin, notice I didn't say if. When I sin, it makes an impact on my relationship with God and with others. And I need to make sure I have a proper understanding and appreciation for what sin is and how it does that. So I say, break my heart. Remind me, God. Call me to be humble. Help me to realize that I'm no better than anybody else. Help me to acknowledge and to recognize the needs that other people have. That's what we're talking about this month as we talk about getting a break. Realizing the truth of who God is what he's done for us and responding to it. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you so much for the opportunity to assemble together this morning. We thank you for each one that is here. And we do pray that each person that is here has made the choice uh, to accept the gift of salvation through Jesus Christ. We know that scripture tells us that there is none righteous, no, not one. That the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Because God so loved the world that he gave his only son. And whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. So we claim that truth today. If there's any here this morning that need to make that choice, Lord, we pray your spirit would speak to their heart. And that they would make that choice and we would rejoice with them. But we pray too that you would challenge each of us. That you would break our hearts anew to the need, to the truth, that we would not be people with hard hearts, but we would allow your spirit to move in our life. We pray that you would change our hearts for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you'll stand as we prepare for our song of response.
we welcome you to share communion with us. You don't have to be a member of our church uh, to share communion with us. You don't have to be a Baptist to share communion, but you have to uh, be at a place in your life where you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, and if you can say He is your Savior, then we invite you to celebrate communion as we remember what He has done for us. But let's give our attention now to Dr. Reeves as he offers us uh, a prayer. Heavenly Father, we come before you today to take the bread and the cup. And we pray, Lord, that the Holy Spirit opens our heart and convicts us of anything that separates us from you. And that we might repent of that now so that we don't take the cup and the bread unworthy. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Heavenly Father, as we come before you humbly this morning, we do again give you thanks and praise. We remember what your Son accomplished for us. We remember the work that the Holy Spirit has done on our behalf. We remember your plan, Lord God. And as we come and hold this piece of bread, which reminds us of the broken body of Jesus, again we ask that you would break us, break our pride, break our heart. Help us to respond to your leading to the work of your Holy Spirit in our lives. Help us to identify those things that would um, distract us from serving you in faith. Lord, we know that nobody is perfect apart from Jesus Christ. And Lord, we ask that you would challenge us. Don't let us allow ourselves to, to let ourselves off easy. Help us to pursue righteousness and godliness, Lord, according to your, your empowerment. 
In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. as we hold this cup, we are reminded that it symbolizes the blood of Jesus that was shed for us. And we're reminded that Scripture says without the shedding of blood, there could be no remission of sin. And Lord, we thank you, God, again, for what you have accomplished. And we pray that as we, as a body of believers, partake of this, as we do this action together, that it would remind us of the unity that we have, a unity that's only possible because of you, God. May we enjoy that and celebrate it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now if you'll stand and take the hand of somebody next to you as we sing our closing song, Into My Heart.
In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. and puts everything on the screen. And if I'm using, if I'm getting Sorry. stuff. Sorry. <laughs> if they Have take you stuff. Us? Are you on traveling, meeting with a group of people? Or? Uh, um, anything that comes off camera, he takes it off. And, it's off and, it's it's it. and then it goes from there down to the DVD here. But the secretary found out it's easier to take it off the camera than it is a DVD, so she takes the camera downstairs, puts it online, and brings it back up. Oh, yeah. But we keep a DVD in the library. Oh. Yeah. I don't know. Jeff's going to be here soon. This is my nephew's wife. He went down to... See, he's gone. I thought he was going to But uh, oh, they're from California. Oh, nice to meet you. Are you the one traveling through? That mm -hmm. about? Okay. Yeah, she's, she's yeah. the one that asked the first. Okay. And uh, Joe May, Bud's son, okay. has been in the hospital down in Wichita. Okay. I wondered if that was... And uh, so I keep him in the hospital. Okay. I think he got out this morning, right? Yes, or no, or some, oh, they're going to see what happened after lunch. Yeah. And then 30 minutes later, he's gone. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Yes, I don't know how our church does it. We get to talking, we get to push my button. <laughs> Did we get recorded? <laughs> no. Um, by the time you leave the second service, they have DVDs that you can take to share of that service. I don't know how they do it. It's like oh, magic. Yeah, they've got to have some special equipment. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, when you're listening to something, yeah, and I need to tell so-and-so. We were just talking about this. Well, then you can just pick it up and share it. Take it to them. It's fun. Yeah, you can check on those prayer requests, whether it's private or public. And you can check it on if you want to make it public. But, uh, Ours aren't that fast. Our DVDs are fast, but not our prayers. <laughs> <laughs> but, no, he prays every request that goes up, goes in the... the well, now you can tell John May or Don can that yeah. the entire congregation pray for him. Oh, uh, back in '79. Yeah. Later than that. Anyway, uh, at least 25 years ago. <laughs> Uh, we went down to Arizona and made a trip through the uh, parks, national parks, on the way back. And before we left, I bought a video camera. Mm -hmm. So I was taking all these tapes all over the country. Came back home and got the bulletin from the church and said, Pastor Dan was looking for somebody to film the Things on Sunday morning. I said, you get anybody yet? Yeah, you. <laughs> I said, okay. He said, do you have a camera? I said, I just bought one. 
He said, can you use it for us until we can get one? And I said, sure. So I started taking tapes. And they're still in the library down there. When they got their own video tape, well, thank God, they brought it up here and I took mine home. So we were still doing, doing tapes. Decades. And then this guy that was running the thing up here said, uh, we need something better than that. We need one that does the DVDs. So he made sure we got a good camera and this set up, and he set it up for me. Nice. Wow. He's out in California now. <laughs> but uh, they always seemed to be fun. Didn't he? <laughs> yeah, he did a good job. Not only that, but he made sure they had an office chair for me to sit on. It's been very nice and comfortable up here for me. Yeah. But I'd say it's been probably 25 years. I've been You've been taping this yeah. service? Uh, wow. I used to 